Hi everyone, my name's Doug. I'm going to go over a 3 tube Alco style 510 amplifier, also known as the Gretsch or Wards. Uh, it was real popular in, in the mid 40s. Here's what the chassis looks like typically. Um, it's fairly small as you can see. Uh, it had a volume and then the tone control was added in about 1946 when the servicemen started coming home from World War II. Uh, so this is a pretty basic model. It has the pilot light, uh, the uh, input jack for your guitar, power switch, and a fuse. Uh, we go over a couple of other things here. Here we go, a 1946 10-inch Fender speaker. How rare is that? Very lucky to have that. The power transformer, uh, the uh, rectifier tube. The preamp tube, this is a 5Y3, this is a 6SL7, very high gain, and the final tube, the 6V6. Uh, this is the filter cap and this is that cheap little output transformer. Uh, they're only five bucks and so they never get warm and uh, it'll work great for our project. So let's move on here. What I'm going to do next is go over just some of the basic stuff that uh, that'll really make your your hobby easier. Uh, one is is these uh, are what's called step bits. Um, they're great for sheet metal. You'll never end up uh, twisting a drill or pulling a burr out. They have stepped increments and they work great for making holes for potentiometer volume controls, jacks, fuses, lights. For sheet metal, these are a gotta have. You can usually get them at Harbor Freight. These are the best wire strippers going. Uh, keep them away from kids because in here are some very strong scissors. Foolproof wire stripping. You can't get enough of these. Also, for sheet metal work, don't you love that sheet metal work? <laughs> these are uh, just duck bill pliers. Uh, they are very strong and they will manipulate sheet metal, straighten them out, bend them, uh, anything you want. Uh, they're pretty handy to have. I got these at Sears. Uh, they also have a, uh, there's a Craftsman brand, they also have a Klein brand. These are at about uh, $14. A small lady, little mini vise. They're pretty handy. I'm going to go over some basic soldering skills right now that should help you save you a lot of frustration. And we'll go ahead and fire up the old soldering iron. This is a Weller. Um, just turn it on. It takes about 30 seconds to heat up. Uh, it's fairly professional design. Uh, it has the wet sponge in there. Spot for carrying your extra tips, which you'll need. I got the big one on there right now. You can see the size of that bad boy. Um, probably got some plastic connected to it. In any event, I'll uh, wait for that to warm up. I'm going to go ahead and just quickly strip this wire. And I just go over some basic soldering tips. And uh, you have to think about not only your temperature but more importantly your surface area of what you're soldering. There, there is a, uh, a formula to soldering and so this is I taught solder classes and I'll just do my rigmarole here real quick. Okay so you see I wipe the soldering iron and it's, it's very clean and I'll go ahead and tin it on both sides. Now that's how it's stored when it's hot. Never leave a dry iron hot. Now I have about three seconds until the solder oxidizes and then it's worthless. Just flick it off, wipe it again, retin it and there we go. Okay so now we have a beautifully tin soldering iron. It's always going to transfer heat and so here we go. I, first I put a little solder on the iron again and now I'm done tinning. It's that fast. There's never a chance where you're going to hold it on there for more than about a second to two seconds maximum. And so now we have a wire conductor that's pre-tinned and it's ready to be applied to any connection you want to make it to. And for instance, here's, here's a resistor. 
and I'm going to solder this wire to this resistor. I'll just show you how fast it goes. Okay, so then a little solder on the iron after I wiped it, a little so more solder on the iron, and it just jumps right onto the resistor lead. Now I'm still within my two to three second window, and now here we go a perfectly mil spec solder connection. It's not mechanically connected beforehand, which is a good idea, but if you're going to be undoing a lot of solder connections, something like this where you pre tin both conductors with a fresh solder tin and a good quality tip on your iron, this will last forever. So basically that's it for the solder class. Get a good soldering iron, have a wide tip, and don't go for max temperature. If you have a variable temperature, leave it at 650. You really don't need to go 700 or above. All that's going to do is melt your insulation back. And remember, two to three seconds of solder life on the tip is basically all you need. Now I just tend it and I'll shut it off with fresh solder on it so next time I turn it on I walk away it's going to be okay. Oxidation is your worst enemy on soldering. Quick pre tinning the connections and uh, fresh solder on the tip. Just touch them, heat them up, they flow together. You end up with that nice bright finish with high surface tension. It's going to float all the oxides off. Pre tinning, that's the whole key. Anytime you have two conductors or a connection and a wire you want to solder together, pre tin them. If you have to go after it with a Dremel with a little wire wheel and get everything clean first, which a lot of the older stuff that I work with is, I have a lot of new old, new old stock, World War II stuff. And um, it does take a bit of brushing, but once you get it clean and you pre tin it, uh, it always works like it's new. So that's it for soldering now. I'm going to go over real quick about some of the meters that I use. Just basic meters. Now, i got to brag, the capacitance meter is really nice to have. Um, this is a, uh, a factory Chinese knockoff of a pretty nice unit called Beckman. Um, it's not for starting capacitors and air conditioning units. That's who I bought this from, and they didn't know what they had. Uh, they had the wrong one. They had one for electronics, not motor starting. So it has a number of ranges. Uh, so it actually has a place for probes and a little spot you can slip the uh, capacitor into. Here are a couple caps. I just want to show you real quick how well it works. Now, it's also got a zero knob. You can zero it out. And you just pop it in there. I don't use this, I use the leads. So, start off on the two microfarad range. It's coming in at 0.009. It's actually a 0.01, so there you go. Uh, it has a nanofarad range. I don't do nanofarads. That's just not normal. You usually just go down and uh, it zeroes from a microfarad down in the picofarad range. Nanofarads from here are still kind of. But you can get the idea. In electronics, there is math involved, so here's a 0.05. Now, like I said, a capacitance meter, some of these part numbers on these things just don't make any sense. So, you really want to see what you got. There's your 0.05. Grab a capacitance meter. I bought this for $39. It's a Packard CTI, and that's the Chinese knockoff of the better Beckman. And it's exactly the same thing. So this is what I recommend. A little bit of internet searching is always good when you're dealing with this hobby. Okay, I have an older fluke meter here. This thing's still hanging in there. I'm gonna go ahead and just show you. Um, basically just measuring the resistor. See these little micro clips that go onto the wires really easy. Actually, these are called the mini clips. The micro ones are too small for what we're doing. And uh, obviously, it's a 2K resistor. <laughs> and so, you know, 
Um, this is a manual range. Uh, you can enjoy automated uh, or auto range meters, but you have to look for the little K and the M in the corner to make sure that, you know, if you read mega ohms or kilo ohms, it can be a little confusing. Also, if you put your fingers across them in auto range, uh, you'll get a reading. And it'll actually be reading through your body or across your fingers. But this one's fixed range. I can just select whatever range I think I'm going to be at. And uh, it makes my measurement. Also, this meter here will go up to, it says, uh, uh, let's see, the max voltage. Uh, it says it'll go up to 900, no, 1000 volts DC and 750 AC. Um, 750 AC is kind of low, actually, because some of these transformers are going to be putting out, you know, 700 volts all day long. AC. Once you rectify them, uh, volts are just going to go up a little bit. But with the 5Y3 tube, it actually loses a lot more than compared to a solid state rectifier like a silicone diode. Silicon diode. I always get those things mixed up. Um, a couple more things about sheet metal. Uh, don't you love the sheet metal? I'll show you a quick trick here on this, but I'm just going to go ahead and talk about it. Some $9 on sale Harbor Freight digital calipers. I've used these things. I have a few that pair of dial calipers, but these are pretty cool. So let's say I want to make a, uh, you know, I have my ruler out, my scriber, and all that. I got a one inch line. I just made a cross cross line for one inch out of this corner as you saw or if I want to mount all my pots down there in a straight line there's my straight line uh, anybody that uses calipers for scribers uh, for some reason my camera keeps stopping anyway we're talking about sheet metal scribing using calipers as a scriber it's a real handy trick also on eBay, I took the plunge and bought a bunch of green leaf punches. These are circular punches. Uh, usually I start off with a small one. And if you don't know how these things work, today, okay. Um, this is the hole and this is the punch. And you'll start a starter hole. This is about a quarter inch. Go ahead and put this through the hole, tighten it up. Now, I'll just go ahead and use a decent quality drill driver and just pop that on there with a socket, drill it on through, it's done in two seconds. And you can go to the next size one, if you like. Um, and then you can finish off with a one inch hole. This is good for the eight pin sockets. So boom, 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 it goes right on through. Well, that's it for the video right now. Um, uh, I want you to kind of study those links I gave you, get familiar with the high voltage safety, and um, start looking at what kind of chassis you're going to find and use. Um, Hammond has some great stuff on the links that uh, I posted on the bill of materials. Also, there's other things like baking pans or old chassis. Anything that's uh, hopefully aluminum, it's easy to work with. Uh, you can do uh, some pretty good stuff with. And if you have an old radio box like I just showed you in the beginning of the video, uh, it can be housed pretty cool. And it looks great. So that'll do it for now. Uh, until the next video, have a great day.